What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Against All Odds podcast. I decided to, to kick this podcast off with a big guest. So we got Michael Cunningham. What's up, guys? How we doing? So um, we're going to get right into it, why he's in Tulsa right now, and then we're going to hop into a little bit about his playing career, and then we'll go straight into some questions that I have that I think hopefully haven't been the typical Q&As that you always get. So uh, let's roll the intro, and then let's get started. I like the uh, intro song. It's yeah. A, it's a bop. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bop. It's a good one. Uh, it does the hardest part because you're like, this song's literally going to be playing for a hundred times. Yep. I can't get tired of it. I, I don't. Yeah. Well, that's good. good. Yeah. Um, so do you want to just start off like why you're in Tulsa right now and yeah. what's going on? Sure. Yeah. So I'm in Tulsa training with FC Tulsa for preseason, seeing if I'll be a good fit for the team. I signed with OPSM, same agency as yourself in... November, I came down for a combine here in Tulsa. So there was a bunch of players all unsigned, just competing and playing in matches. A few coaches watching from different clubs from the USL. I think there was a couple of USL one, USL two coaches. And basically with the goal was OPSM was looking at players to sign. Clubs were looking at potential guys to bring into preseason and ended up being a good opportunity for me and signed with OPSM. And this is my second team that they've kind of set me up with. Um, I first went with a NISA club for a while. It was a, it was a good opportunity. It was a good experience, but I think I was ready for something else. And uh, the USL is just a little bit more developed this time. So when I knew there was potential that I could come into a USL championship club, I was mm -hmm. frothing at that opportunity, of course, because... It would be the highest level I've certainly ever been at. And I really wanted to push outside my comfort zone, especially after how last year went with COVID and everything. A lot of leagues either getting postponed, delayed, restarted, or just canceled altogether. I wanted a solid structure, you know, to train in daily and develop. Mm -hmm. So down here for, I've been here just over a week and not sure how long I'm going to be here before they decide either way. Has it only been a week? A week, oh, oh. Week and two days. So last uh, Wednesday. In my I came, head, I was thinking it was like we're coming all in three weeks. Already. Yeah, it feels, it feels like, like double it feels, days feels like two days all the time. A, that's it. So a lot of sessions, but yeah, only nine days of training. So yeah, huh. still early on. That's funny. And, and I'll say it because I know it's always tough whenever you're on trial, but Michael's doing very well. I think like 100% at the USL championship level. Thanks, man. Yeah, 100%. Um, that's good. It's always, it's always, every time you go on trial, it's always so difficult because it's, it's you're coming in as like, an outsider yeah you don't really know many people and then it's all like you have to basically prove yourself but also most of the time it's all about kind of like building up the team yeah so then like you come in on trial and it's not just like oh yeah let's just play small-sided stuff or, or full games to watch the trial list it's like no we're working on the team yeah and you better prove yourself in those small drills and yeah. everything that's right and i think up until this point we were just chatting on the way up here we haven't had you know, a long stretch of just game time yet. It's been a lot of drills, a lot of building on certain tactics that mm -hmm. the coach is trying to implement into the season. So you do feel like as a new guy, you've you've not had the opportunity to show what you can do naturally. And you just kind of got to blend in the mix and just try and take the information on board and not break down the patterns that you guys are so yeah. used to doing. And, and there's obviously that first day of school feel that goes along with it. So, yeah. you know, definitely out of my comfort zone right now, but with each day you feel a little bit more comfortable and I'm excited to yeah. see where it goes. And I, I'm glad like you talked about like comfort zone too, because that's literally like a hundred percent of trial. Like yeah. it's just everything about it is uncomfortable. Yeah. Like, I mean, everything about it, you basically come in, everybody's kind of watching you, especially the first touch, the first yeah. pass. Yep. And then it's just, uh, <laughs> it's always a little bit added. It's just a lot of pressure and you kind of want to, and you want to do so well and you want to, you, it's like high stakes. Yeah. So it's, it's uncomfortable, but at the same time, it's, it, I think like when people talk about, like, and we've talked about this too in our last podcast that we did virtually over zoom yeah. but about growing mentally and becoming mentally stronger. I think you said something that still I'm like, yeah, it's about like, you have to go out and, and basically train your brain or train your mental toughness like any other muscle. You have to go through very hard things mentally yeah. in order to be like, come mentally stronger. And like, I love that because it's like 100% true. You can do all the mental training at home or whatever, but you really, honestly, if you want to get mentally stronger, you have to physically go out and put yourself in uncomfortable situations. Definitely. Yeah, it was an interesting start to this opportunity because of there's new restrictions and there's new procedures that each club has to go through now with bringing new players in and I was the first new player 
to come in. So I was kind of the guinea pig, but I basically had to sit in my hotel for a few days and quarantine and get a few tests before I could come in to train with the guys. And I didn't know the exact date I was starting. I thought I was coming in right away mm-hmm. to train. I, I flew in on a Sunday. I thought I was going in on the Monday. Then I found out that Sunday night, you know, you're not going in, you might not go in for a whole week. So I went in for two tests and I finally got in on the Wednesday. So a little bit earlier than I was expected, yeah. but even that was a little bit last minute. But even just those couple of days of sitting there, you know, you're in the hotel, uh, thinking, knowing that the players are out there training. I actually went and got some touches at the field and saw you guys warming up one day. And you're trying to sort of get yourself ready, mentally ready. And how should I go in? You know, should I be, how confident should I be? And this and that, there's a lot of mind games Mm -hmm. with it. And I I think this opportunity in particular was a little bit more mentally challenging because you just had that time by yourself sitting, waiting and not knowing when you're going in. And then suddenly finding out, okay, tomorrow you can go in. And then I just came off quite a heavy day in the gym because I was like, okay, I don't have to train for this week. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and I, I flew my wife in because I was like, hey, I'm not going to be training for the week. You want to come and hang out? And then she gets here on the Tuesday in the late afternoon and I literally get an email maybe 45 minutes after she lands like hey you're going into training tomorrow and it's double days for the rest of the week so <laughs> I was like, obviously I, disappointed for her I'll Sorry. see you, I'll see you in three days yeah. Becca we were like talking about all these coffee shops we were going to go to <laughs> restaurants and then mm. I'm just like a zombie for the rest of the day after yeah. training now is this your first time in Tulsa besides the combine like was that the first yeah. two times so the combine I was here for a long weekend I got in on a Friday night left on a Monday morning so just a couple of days and then this is my first time kind of actually exploring the area before I was literally just up at the hotel which was right near the um the Titan mm-hmm. complex so I didn't do too much exploring so I just literally went to the combine each day and then flew right back out so this is my first time getting a feel of Oklahoma I suppose yeah it, it's funny because like I'm, I'm switching gears a little bit but going back like a year or two like I remember like obviously I've known about your channel known about you since like 2016 like when I was in Germany yeah and I think we both were like in in the few hundred subscribers at that point yep. a thousand subscribers or something and then um but anyway like I knew about you and then I kind of like had just known about your career a little bit going down to like New Zealand and Australia or is it which one was it is I it? went to Australia Australia yeah. going down to Australia and, and going abroad and then obviously playing college soccer here before that and then I, I knew that like I'd watched a video about your story and seeing that you were like trying with the Rochester rhinos and everything and training yeah. there. And then since then it would, for the, like the last two or three years, you were just like in Rochester yep. playing with the Lancers and then playing with the, is that the, that's the outdoor team, right? Yeah. There's the MPSL team and then there's the MASL. The yeah. Are they both the, what's their names? Uh, both Rochester Lancers, okay, same coach right. yeah. and some of the players overlap between the two. Uh, there's definitely some players that are strictly indoor some players are strictly outdoor mm-hmm. and then i'd say there's a core group of maybe around eight guys that kind of yeah okay flip flat between yeah. yeah and then so i saw that i was thinking i was always thinking to myself like you know because obviously you can watch somebody on youtube and you, although I, you definitely need to see someone in person but you can be like yeah i wonder if he's gonna just be there like for the rest of his career yeah. if he's gonna push away because it's hard as you get older you start wanting to setting down roots and yeah. you start thinking about that but i was always curious it's like do you want to just stay in Rochester or you want to make one more push and try to go and yeah. kickstart the career? And then, so this pretty much answered that question. Yeah. And I think it goes, I think this, this phrase, the comfort zone is going to come up a lot in this podcast, but I felt like I went into a heavy comfort zone in Rochester. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to college there, so I knew the area. I met my wife there. Everything was very familiar. A lot of the players I was playing with on the Rochester Lancers, a couple of guys I played in college with a couple of guys I just knew from the area. So it was very, a welcome home feeling, especially after coming from going and playing in Australia, did a little stint in the Philippines, went back to the UK after a year of that was really turbulent. I think once when you experience that comfort zone again, it's extra comfortable just because of how adventurous you've been. You know, it's just it's that normality. It feels stable. So when I had the opportunity to go in with the rush to Lancers, first I just wanted somewhere to play, and I was thinking, okay, I'll use this as a stepping stone. I'm just getting back to the US need to build my resume because when I was leaving for Australia, I was training with the the Rochester Rhinos. Mm -hmm. When I came back, that was the year that they ended up folding. But the reason I left is because I wanted to escape my comfort zone again. You know, the coach said you can come back in. I was, I was training while I was still in college, but he said, come back next year. Maybe we can even get you on the roster, get you a few minutes and build your experience. But I was like craving that 
that new experience once again. And when the Australian opportunity came up, it was technically the second tier. So I thought it'd be, you know, a similar level. And I was like, why not try something completely new? So when I finally came back to Rochester, I really craved that stability over Mm -hmm. again, I think. And then as I I thought it was just going to be a year there, I ended up playing indoor nearby a city about an hour away from Rochester. Uh, that was through the MPSL season because we played against a team called Syracuse and one of the assistant coaches helped out with the indoor team in Syracuse. So he ended up getting me a trial there. So I ended up playing MASL for a season Then I went back to the Lancers for a second year playing MPSL and then the the Lancers came back in the MASL. So it was just kind of, it felt like it fit really well. It just kind of fit my journey at the time. I'd been playing a little bit of indoor so it's quite convenient. I didn't really have any other options that I felt I, you know, were strong chances of me going anywhere at the time. So again, I just stayed in that comfort, bub- comfort bubble. There were places that were guaranteeing me a lot of time on the pitch, a lot of touches of the ball. So at the time it felt like the right fit. If I could, in hindsight, I think I should have gone out and explored, but you know, everything comes at the right time. And I think, that's something I've always lived by. It's where success, success is where opportunity and preparation kind of meet. And I feel like this, this particular opportunity came at the perfect time. I don't know if I would have been ready a couple of years ago, even though I'm, I'm 30 now, I'm definitely into the last chapter of my playing career for sure. I think this is the height of my career now. It's, we were talking about mm-hmm. it the other day. It's been a steady incline a little bit. I'd say probably going from Australia back to the MPSL was a little up and then down. But now it's hopefully going to an, another stage now, wherever it might be. So I think it's it's an interesting ride, but I think it's it feels right. It feels mm-hmm. like it's all gone at the right pace. I think it's allowed me to mature mentally, physically as a player. I do feel like I'm in the best shape of my life, but I do feel like mentally I'm in the best place as well. And when that's kind of all clicking, your how you're feeling physically with how you understand the game that's when you feel the most confident on the pitch. And I feel like I'm only kind of getting to that peak now, I would mm-hmm. say. So if I do end up staying here or you know somewhere else in the USL or USL1, perhaps, I feel like this will be the right time for it for me. Yeah. No, I, and I remember we were talking about this too. Like I said that like at 28, I'm feeling like I'm in the prime of my career, mm-hmm. best, best shape like physically like physically mentally i feel like the game's the slowest it's ever been like when you play yeah it's just so crazy and like i I just feel like you know obviously your body starts to break down but i think now too with better nutrition now that athletes are doing taking care of your body doing all the prehab that everybody's doing now i think that like it's not unrealistic to say that 30 might be like the prime of your career 31 now i mean you're looking at some of these players in europe like that are playing until 37, 36 yeah. and still performing at a high level. There's no reason why, obviously you're not gonna be playing at the same level, but the body can still do all the same stuff. Yeah. Where before it was like you're 30, it's like, okay, you better, you better start dropping down, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, just ra- how, uh, have you thought about how long you wanna play? Like, do you have a set age? Have you and Becca talked about it? Because again, too, it's obviously as a kid, you're just thinking I wanna play until my, I can't. Yeah. But then once you have a wife, once you have, you know, you said comfort and stability is nice to have at some points in your life. Are you thinking about that? Like what, what are yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, I think for the first time, the last couple of years, I've been thinking about it a little heavier, especially with indoor. I was gonna say I was only gonna play another couple of years just because with indoor, it's very physical, very demanding on the body because it's all sprints. It's all sprints, mm-hmm. it's all turns. You're getting bashed into the boards. It's basically hockey with with a ball. And I don't think I've come off one indoor season without a few, a few areas of my body that just felt like they needed some time to recover. Like whether it's my knee or ankle, even my elbow. I remember I dislocated a few fingers, like mm-hmm. just these, all these little things. So I was like, I don't think I can do this for much longer and, and feel like I'm gonna retire healthy. Not saying I'm trying to avoid, there's a lot of injuries that are unavoidable, but I think with indoor, you, it comes with the territory a little mm-hmm. bit more. When it comes to outdoor, obviously as much as my body lets me, if, I, if you're gonna ask me today, I, I think I could probably go another three, four years quite healthy maybe taper off and um, I, I would, what would be kind of cool is to end the career sort of an assistant coach player kind of thing. So I'm helping more behind the scenes of a club, but also out on the pitch as well. I don't know what that kind of looks like, if that's possible, but 
I think I've got a couple more years of being in my peak fitness, peak understanding of the game. I still think I have a good amount to offer as of this very moment. So I would like to think two, three years at a high level, I would mm-hmm. hope. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And then I know people are going to be so curious about this too. Um, but how are, I want to talk a little bit about how like your experience right now, FC Tulsa, like how have you thought the trainings have been and the level? Yeah. And I know we've talked about this, but it'd be, I think a lot of people are going to be very curious about your thoughts on FC Tulsa. Yeah. So the only other levels I've played in the US are USL2, mm-hmm. same league you were in. We played against each other. Back Which is in, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I know this was before either of us were really on YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. And didn't know each other existed, but played against each other. You were a striker at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've played MPSL. So I would say it is a jump from the MPSL to USL Championship, definitely. I, and I was telling you the other day, one of the things that really stands out for me at this level, I think at the MPSL, if you can get guys playing really well-weighted passes, you can get a lot of tiki taka football, mm-hmm. very good sequences of play, but the ball has to be played perfect, you know, a nice rolling ball and they can play at one touch. What I've noticed at the USL Championship, at least training with you guys, I noticed a little bit at the Rhinos as well. Even when the ball isn't played perfect, it might be bubbling, the guys still take it one touch, you know, and it's still bopping around and it's moving very quickly. And I think sometimes when you're watching a game like on TV and you see this one touch football, you assume because the camera's panned out that it's all crisp passes, perfectly weighted and everything. It's not the case all the time. Sometimes it is bubbled in, but the guy has the confidence and the technique to take those bubbling balls and play another one touch pass. And some of the sequences that I've seen over the last week of training have been really good. The way you guys play through the midfield, you're not trying to bypass any areas, even if it's clustered, even if players have defenders on their back, you're all trusting each other with the ball, playing in with pace and it's it's very fluent. So mm-hmm. I'd say the speed of the game is definitely a lot faster at this level. Guys technique is, is very consistent, a lot less mistakes. There's still mistakes, but just far less you know i would say eight nine times out of ten guys are playing correct passes and then there is the often breakdown but if you're looking at the mpsl maybe every every five or six passes it's it's a little bit less consistent so i've really enjoyed the training it's a lot of tight space possession work so far getting guys comfortable on the ball in tight spaces which i think is really good because in those times where we do finally open out and go 11 v 11 you feel like you have so much more time on the ball so I think it's really good that the coach really condenses the play, gets guys technical on the ball, gets them making decisions really quickly. Um, yeah, it's, it's been really enjoyable so far. And I think especially after not being in a team environment for a little while after how last year went, it's a little bit of a shell shock mm-hmm. at first, but I think that's what you need to be doing. You need to be, I think you need to be in a situation where it just feels above your level because you, you do adapt to it. Mm-hmm. If you're, if you're going in somewhere and you're like, Oh, I'm, I'm so comfortable here. That might not be the right choice. If you're somebody that wants to advance and improve, but it feels perfect. It feels just above anything I've experienced, but not so out of reach where I feel overwhelmed. I feel like I'm starting to get more comfortable learning guys, their habits and, I feel like I'm already improving, you know, in a mm-hmm. week of playing and uh, excited to see what happens next, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I think the same, I say the same exact thing about the differences of, of the levels. Yeah. Like it's just a little bit less mistakes. It's like, like a being a little bit faster speed of play mentally yeah. one step ahead. It's just like these tiny things. And I, I think like what you said too, about like improving, like one of my biggest tips ever for any player is like to improve is find players that are better than you yeah. and train with those guys. It's like, again, outside your comfort zone, you're going to be going mm-hmm. to some places and, and not being the man, but like it improves so much. Like even this off season training with like Rubio Rubin, that MLS guy training with this guy who was playing over in the first division in the Netherlands. Like it's just, yeah. you can see they even have a little bit more quality on the ball. They're a little bit faster mentally. They can play a little bit quicker and more accurately in these tight spaces. But like you start to rise up to that yeah. level and you feel like you just, it's just, you improve so much. And so like, that's like a huge thing. I feel like is always go play at a faster level, higher level if you can. And if you can't like, just find one other person that's better than you, older than you and play one V ones to challenge yourself that yep. way. So like, yeah, it's, it's huge. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's for me too. It's always kind of surreal. Like, like I said, it's whenever you, it's funny cause I get people coming into training 
or training with, they're like, oh, I have to watch you on YouTube. It's funny to now train with you. I feel like I have a little bit of that, like, oh yeah, it's <laughs> training with Michael Cunningham. He's, he's here. It's, it's, it's weird to have that, uh, like flipped a little bit, which is really yeah. cool. Yeah. It's funny. There, a couple of the guys have started mentioning it mm -hmm. at first. I was like, wow, this is so nice. Nobody knows. I know, I knew you would know who I am cause we've, we've spoken before, yeah. but I never thought our first real life interaction would be in preseason together, but yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to complain about it at all. But yeah, a couple of the guys have mentioned, hey, I watched some of your videos. And to me, that's odd when, especially when somebody's playing at a higher level than you, like, hey, watch your videos. I appreciate them. You're just a little bit like, uh, mm -hmm. those videos aren't for you, mate. Like, they're, they're, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're already doing your thing. But at the same time, you really can just learn from yeah, anybody, anybody, you know, anybody. Everybody's got their own experiences, their take on the game. And that's what YouTube's so, mm -hmm. so great for. Yeah, I mean, even drills, like learning different drills that like you just get bored of doing the same drills all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And the amount of times like I'll train with somebody whoever like even high schooler and i'm like you you pick a drill you do a drill now because i just i don't want to keep doing mine you want to go yeah. outside your comfort zone and training and do something that you've never done before like one training i had with this college kid like a couple of years ago we're doing like the outside the foot touch mm -hmm. i was terrible at it but like i you know it's obviously not that game realistic but still i mean you still use that touch maybe once yeah. a week you know, just randomly in the game, we're like, oh, it's out here. So it's just like a outside the comfort zone, doing something new, new drill. It's it's all, it's all good. Um, how is it too? This is always something that's I feel like only really a few people in the world can relate to, and and us for sure. But when we're talking about going outside your comfort zone in the first day of school vibes and with a new trial, how is it now too that you have a YouTube channel? I do you feel like that adds a little bit extra pressure on your first day in, in a trial? Yeah, definitely. I think. I think I noticed it more at the combine when I came to the combine, mm -hmm. the, it was a become elite OPSM collaboration. So I think a lot of people were there expecting you to be there. So I think people who watch your channel, there's a few that overlap and watch my channel too. So I went in and I was recognized all over the place kind of thing. People coming up to you before you've even touched a ball. Hey, I love your videos. Hey man, you're really good. This mm -hmm. and that and the other. And you're like, Oh wow. <laughs> like you're not coming in with a neutral opinion yeah. from anyone. Yeah. You're coming in with a high expectation and you're just like, man, I need to deliver on this kind of, so it is a little bit, I've gotten used to it, but I think the first time I ever experienced that it does add that little bit of pressure and you start thinking, Oh, I've got to show something that is, it's weird. You, you feel like you've almost got to show something you don't even show in the YouTube videos. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, I've got to bang one in from 40 yards or something like that. Whereas even though the YouTube channel is all about simple drills or just touches and this and that and the other, just doing it at pace, you do f feel like you have that impression that you've got to walk away with everybody. Kind of, you feel like you've got to deliver on their expectation and yeah. it's, it's not always realistic, you know? So 100%. how about you? You feel like that? Yeah. 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 Like I, I've been fortunate that I ne haven't really needed to go and do a trial in the last couple of years. Uh, but yeah, at, every time, every combine, every trial I've been on, um, you can, I don't know if it's mentally just me thinking that, yeah. but like, or if it's actually happening, but the same thing, some people will come up beforehand and say, they're like, my video is my first day at Tulsa when they were the roughnecks back when I was training in 2018, same thing. A couple guys, the first day or two came up and said, Hey, I love your videos, you know? Yeah. And I was coming from New Zealand. So coming from a lower level, trying to get back up. And again, it was just like a, a weird feeling of like, I'm trying to make your team, but then I felt yeah. like, Oh, they're watching my videos and like them. I need to wow them, but I don't want to be like, I don't want to mess up, but yet just play my game. Like he, yeah. just this mental mind game that's going through and you kind of feel like that's for sure how some top players that have a lot, a big following when they go on to new teams or yeah. any, every day at training, a new player comes. Like if I were to go to like PSG, I'd for sure be watching Neymar every touch he did, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd be obsessed course. about that. So like, it, it's, it's, I'm not comparing myself to Neymar or anything, but, but you, got, uh, you got a little sauce. Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My two star skill yeah. moves. But, uh, but no, I mean, that's, uh, that's like, that's kind of like the reality of like social media and having yeah. like a little bit of a following. It's just very, very interesting. Yeah. I think with YouTube, I think, Earlier on, it used to be about kind of showing off, right? Doing something mm -hmm. amazing on YouTube. And it did kind of shift to more educational. So, but I think that stigma kind of carried over a little bit that if you put stuff on YouTube, you, you think you're a big shot or mm -hmm. this or that and the other, but it really just is a platform to teach on. It's like, I'm sure you've done one-on-one -on -one lessons with people in person. That's what I was doing one summer at college. And I just thought it's so much easier doing this on YouTube. because yeah. More people can see it. You can be more efficient with your time. Instead of training one person for an hour, you can spend that hour and train 
thousands of people, right? Mm. Virtually. So, but I think there is that stigma that if you're able to talk on camera or is, yeah, it's just got a weird stigma attached to YouTuber it. YouTuber stigma. Yeah. Like just YouTuber. a classic that's YouTuber. It. Yeah. Um, yeah. It. No, a hundred percent. Like, that's and that's f- so funny. You said that too, cause that's literally why I started. I do yep. a one-on-one session, be sweating, doing all this stuff and just be like, this is one kid I'm one reaching hour. Yep. like yeah. one kid I'm reaching. And I, I feel like you post your first video and it's going to get 30 views. And still even that I was like, I'm reaching 30 kids yep. that are, are now hearing my like knowledge on whatever I'm talking about. So like literally that's what was so motivating for me to keep going on that, those early stages of like, I would think when I would get 500 views, it wasn't like that's so embarrassing to me. It was like, that's 500 people yeah. watching my, what I'm saying. Like, yeah. That's what someone always said to me. Like imagine if, if it was 25 people, imagine 25 people in a room, you'd mm-hmm. feel a little bit differently. You know, if you saw those people physically and you had to teach them something. So you should always respect and appreciate anybody who's following your stuff. So I think that's my biggest, I think you get a lot of questions as well. I'm sure. How do you start? Hey, my channel is not growing. If anybody's watching and you love, what you're doing you should continue doing it because mm-hmm. somebody's benefiting from yeah. it yeah and you can't ask for more than that really yeah 100 percent. i i need to switch the cameras yeah. off and back on so we'll take a quick break All and then right. we'll be right back and hop into the q a okay we're back um i think we're just gonna hop into the q a right now uh i got some hopefully some decent questions so i'll just start listing through them but the first one we kind of already touched on a few of these questions that i have uh, but what are the positives and negatives associated with running a successful YouTube channel and also playing soccer? Yeah, positives. My favorite is when you meet someone just out and about who comes up to you and says, hey, I watch your YouTube videos. They're so helpful. Mm-hmm. That is like the biggest affirmation you can get. And it's so rewarding to actually have a chat with somebody and they explain to you how it's benefiting them. You hear a little bit about their journey and you feel like you've been a part of it in some way. It's kind of that confirmation that you sometimes need because YouTube can be, a br- the internet in general can be mm. just an awful place, you know? And um, sometimes when you're just reading comments, as much as I appreciate them, it's, it's just, it's not like having a conversation with a person. You can't see what this person looks like. You can't see their body language. And so it's, it absorbs a lot differently when someone compliments you through a comment than they do in real life. That's the biggest one for me. It's just that, that gratification you get from feeling like you're truly helping. Another plus is maybe not so much earlier on when you're just starting, but now I can, I can take on these opportunities. I can come down to talk, come down to Tulsa for a few weeks on a tentative timeline. I don't need to know exactly how long I need to be here and I can still provide for my family, which is pretty awesome. It, it takes a lot of the stress out of this. It allows me to just focus on what I need to do. I don't need to compromise on taking time off work or anything like that. I don't need to put my family in jeopardy mm-hmm. as a result of me pursuing my dreams. So it, it's enabling, I would say. So I think everybody should be on YouTube, whatever career they're in, because it just gives you that extra layer of opportunity, of reach. It still allows you to do exactly what you have been doing already just to a bigger audience. And it can lead to these kind of situations and these circumstances where you can be remote and be a little bit more flexible with your lifestyle. That's huge for me. And I don't know much, how much I love that until I, I got it. But now I'm here that it's like I could never imagine going back to like a more typical lifestyle, I guess. Mm-hmm. Negatives, I think we touched upon it, you know, it, it does put a little bit of expectation on you. I think when you meet people, they expect some kind of level from you. They expect that, you know, everything. And there's a lot of things that we don't know, you mm-hmm. know, and, and I think what's good about both of our channels, I, I can tell with your channel, especially you try to get the opinions of others. You try to consult other people, collaborate with others because you know, you don't know everything and you're always thirsting for more knowledge and, you know, being with those people, you're going to learn more, but also indirectly your audience is going to learn more as well. And I think that's really cool. Um, ne- other negatives. I mean, apart from the, the amount of time that we spend doing yeah, it, I think yeah. people maybe don't understand how much, I think a lot of people, like, they'll make comments to me like, oh, you have a nice life. Oh, it's like, mm-hmm. it's just do what you want. I'm like, I probably put in like double the amount of hours just because you obsess about it's because it's all you, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? So you want everything to be perfect by your standards, you know, and you never switch off from it. It's mm-hmm. not like 
you go to a nine to five, you clock out at five and you go home. It's like you're mentally always checked in and you wake up, you're thinking about it. And I remember, I don't know if it was in a podcast, but you said it perfectly. As soon as that video is uploaded, immediately you're like, okay, what have I got to make next? Yeah. So the you don't get that opportunity to sit back and kind of bask on your work for long. It's really day by day kind yeah. of thing. So, but we love it, right? So yeah. Yeah, no, the, uh, the never switching off is like crazy. Like I look at my teammates mm-hmm. and they're like, right now they're just going home and yep. whatever, like free, free time. I mean, I, I'm trying to think if anybody has anything extra. Like I, I know some people that have run like a little do one, one on one coaching and stuff, but like uh, most guys just go back and like I was even when Rodrigo said it this morning. He's like, yeah, I've just been bored. So I just watch soccer games. And I'm like, <laughs> I've never, I life. haven't been yeah. bored in years yeah but it is it's like a, it's a good problem to have because i think and, and i think that like again like everybody should be doing it if you want to if that's right. an interest with your life but it is a lot of work and you really do have to love Sometimes. it or else it's you're going to be out so fast but it's funny because like i think too everybody should be doing some sort of like documenting their life or something because like i was sitting on my computer and i was watching a it was like a steel worker it was like a day in the life of like a steel worker in new york and i was sitting there watching it like completely transfixed on this video and i was like why am i what am i doing and then i'm like it, it wasn't even like that the video or his life was so uh interesting it was more just like i just wanted to see what this other person's life was yeah. what he was doing so it just kind of shows like other people's lives are just interesting. You want to see what other people are up to. It's almost like being a little nosy by nature, like humans are. So it's just yeah. so, so interesting. Yeah. I, I, I suppose an extra positive as well, just a little side note is that there is a certain feeling you get, especially in football, I suppose, because the careers are short. And that I think there is always that lingering question, what are you going to do when you hang up the boots kind of thing? It gives you a little bit more reassurance when mm-hmm. you're building something on the side of playing. That isn't, ta- it's not taking away any focus from your training. It's adding to it. It's just like being productive with the free time outside of it. And sometimes coinciding, you know, like us, we document a lot of our training sessions, but it kind of gives you a little bit of reassurance knowing you do have something to go at 100 percent after playing as well you know once once playing days are over because that that time does come for all of us and there are some players who do nothing in their extra time now and maybe they have got a a plan or whatnot after they've hung up their boots but there are a huge portion of players who hang up their boots and literally they have to figure it out after Mm -hmm. that and that that can be quite stressful there's plenty of documentaries on footballers you know who their careers end sometimes earlier than expected through injury, through not finding a contract or whatnot. And they've got to literally pivot their entire life and figure out what they're going to do next kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So there is a, there is a, that's a little bit of a deeper one, I guess, but there's, no, that, there's a comfort in that. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I think about that all the time. I, I honestly have said that if I didn't have YouTube, I think I would have quit during my injury in 2018. Cause at that point it was like wow. dropping down uh, taking a pay cut, like doing all this stuff. Like I was like, I don't, I don't know. Like I'll never really know, but I think that could have been a moment where I was like at 25 been like, okay, it's time to get a yeah. big boy job, go back to school, finish the degree. Like, I really don't know. Cause I mean, in the USL, you're not making money where you're, anybody's going to retire. So, I mean, even the best player in the USL, I mean, is going to make great money, but they're not going to be retiring from it. Yeah. And so it's like, like, I think, at that point at 25, I probably would have been like, yeah, it's time to, cause I had a, like a girlfriend, like Mimi still. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's, I go back and forth. I don't know if I would have quit. Yeah. Or gave it another year. I really don't know. It's so It's funny you say that. Cause I, I think I was 26. I got a MCL injury. I came back to the U S after. So basically I told you about it, but I went back to England after Australia and I was thinking, okay, I'm just going to get a normal job, start a normal life. And I got a job at HSBC, a bank there. And the start date was deferred by two months. So I had two months basically to do nothing before I started working there. So we came back to the U S cause my wife's from here. So we were going to kind of tie up some loose ends. I was going to see if there's any little opportunities here and there. I went for a tryout at Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh river hounds. Mm-hmm. And, um, like day two, I get this MCL injury and I knew it right away. It was like a little bit worse than anything I've ever experienced. But so then all of a sudden I'm sitting at at the apartment and there was all these little things that just happened. Like for some reason, so basically when I got married, me and my wife, we 
consolidated our bank account, but we put it in her name because she had a US account and I didn't mm-hmm. at the time. So we just put it in her name. We're like, we'll figure out later on. And then there was all these complications like HSBC needed to see my bank statement from the previous year to make sure that, you know, I don't know, they had to do some checks on something. And um, so I didn't have a bank account in my name, so they couldn't actually get me in on that date. So then that was delayed another couple of months. So I'm in the US, I'm sitting there, like wondering what I'm going to do. Like, oh, I need a job. I can't work in the US, don't have a green card, I'm injured. That's when I kind of picked up on YouTube a mm-hmm. little bit more because I was like, I just need something to keep me sane. Yeah. Make me feel like I'm doing something, even if it's just for my own, like my own <laughs> mentality, I guess. But that's when I really picked it up and we were, we were applying for my green card during that time. But I wonder if I didn't pick up YouTube, if I would have just healed and then just got a normal job and just mm. been like okay that's enough goofing around trying to find different teams and whatnot but i think youtube kind of did maybe save that a little bit for me as well so yeah i mean it's, again it's impossible to say but i do mm-hmm. wonder because there is an accountability with youtube you know you, you don't want to yeah. let people down there's a lot of people rooting for you i don't know if i would have came to this opportunity now you know it's another switch around in terms of coming down to a new place once again going to you know, if things work out here, I'll have to move down for a bit. And there's that dynamic that me and my wife will have to figure out now. But there is there is that bug still inside of me that I want to play. And But there's also that, that layer of being on YouTube and wanting to inspire people, you know, mm-hmm. and showing that the training can be put into something productive. It's not just for for a laugh, you know, there's yeah. there's a method, there's, there's a reason why we work this hard and... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, interesting stuff. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> really good. Um, what do you think is your unique skill or skills that help you find success both on the field and on YouTube? Because I know like we both are saying like everybody should start YouTube, but a lot of people, they don't like they, they start their YouTube channel and then it kind of fizzles out or doesn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. We both have had fairly successful YouTube channels. Why do you think like, what do you think? Do you have any particular skill do you think that helps that? And also has helped you find success as a footballer Hmm. and they can be different skills like whatever whatever you think um i think i liked i'm very detail oriented in terms of like how i explain things i think especially when i started out i think all of my videos were like 10 minutes plus and i'd be talking about one thing i'd really just like overkill the details But I appreciate that because that's how I like to learn. I like the more Mm -hmm. information, the better. I don't like people to assume that I know any of it. You know, I like someone to basically talk to me like this is the first time I'm ever doing it. Even if you're a pretty competent footballer, I still deliver each of my tutorials like you've never kicked a soccer ball before, you know. And I think people did appreciate that at first because everybody's coming to learn something different. They might know how to plant their foot. They might know the area of the foot they need to kick with. The only little detail they might need to adjust is the area of the ball they want to kick or, you know, their follow through or something like that. Everybody has something that is going to be the switch for them to be like, oh, that was it. So I think the more detail I pour into it, the better, because then you kind of cover more, a a larger audience, I guess, and you help more people that way. So I think I've, always deliver my videos with the assumption that they've never played before, which I think people, I don't know if they still appreciate it now, but at the time Mm -hmm. it was, um, they could sit through that. It seemed like they could get from the beginning to end and they can take in those details. I did get, you know, a lot of comments saying, Hey, your videos are quite long or a bit (laughs) too long. And I'd be like, that's okay. You know, and I would always respond like, Hey, I'm always just trying to deliver as much information as possible. You can always skip ahead or, you know, if this channel isn't for you, that's great. But I always wanted to remain, that way, you know, and I think I've always stayed true to my personality as well. I'm quite a mellow guy. I don't think I'm very, I'm definitely not a type A person, you know, I'm a little bit more introverted and uh, I like deeper talks rather than going to like a big loud place and whatnot. So I think that helps me, my communication style is a little bit more like I'm having a conversation with another human being. I'm not like, hey guys, what's, you know. Yeah, which like a typical YouTuber. Yeah, which like- is really entertaining. If, if that's your personality, that's great. But I think I, I try not to be a YouTuber. You mm-hmm. know, I just tried to be me on YouTube. Yeah. I guess that was, that's something I've always 
thought had had helped me along the way just like be really i know it's so cliche to say this but it really is about being yourself because yeah. you're only going to deliver a message in the best way if you're being yourself because mm -hmm. if you're trying to act you're going to feel like you're scripting you're going to feel like you're not being genuine you're going to get burnt out and i think that's what's helped me be able to do it for so long as well and stay consistent with it is like i'm never when i switch on the camera i don't feel like i'm acting you know what yeah. i mean it's not exhausting it's just like it's another day of me being me so 100%, you can do yeah. that every single day um yeah no i think that's that that's huge of like it's just me on youtube because it's like i i mean i always feel like too like the viewers are always smarter than you like people a lot of people give them credit like it's smart people and you literally go out there and you try to fake something yeah it, it, the people are gonna see right through that yeah like that's even for me it's like like i'm very like uh like like what's the, i don't know how to, i'm very white like you know like, i'm just very white and so if i would go on youtube well, and try sure. to be like cool yeah like right. it wouldn't work I, you know like people would be like this guy's not cool yeah so yeah so like i'm always trying to be like just say my typical things i say my the, my like what i say my jokes all this yeah. stuff and i feel like it works because people are like yeah that's that's him he's a, yeah. he's a dork you're like a and professor it, on youtube <laughs> yeah, but it's so it's so good <laughs> it's so high quality you know it's not and if someone tried to deliver that with like a you know i don't know like the f2 do or something yeah. like that that message is not going to get mm. across you don't get taken seriously so that's great you just yeah, find you, your you find your niche like that that's whatever and that, that's why people get on youtube it's like and they're even competing channels or whatever. It's like, you can never copy someone else completely. Yeah. Like uh, me and my like personality, you and your personality, that's a big part of your brand and channel. And no matter what, nobody can copy that. Yeah. Cause it's you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You just take, you got to take the person for who they are. And I think that's, that's definitely helped both of us, Yeah, you know, just, and it, and I, I think that burnout thing is huge. If you're, and I think that's why a lot of people stop. They, they get into YouTube and they have a certain expectation for themselves and they're not being themselves on camera and then they burn out quickly and it's not rewarding for them. And I think you can handle videos not performing well as long as you know you've done your best, you've been yourself and you've put out the best quality information. You can always live with that, I think. But it's when people act all this and it's probably so exhausting to act and then it doesn't get the views and they're like, well, I'm not going to do this anymore, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. How long does it take? Oh, maybe just walked in. It's not me, me. <laughs> how long does it I've take replaced you her. Yeah, yeah. I've replaced yeah. her. how long does it take you to make a video like hour wise from filming or brainstorming other from brainstorming until publish from yeah mm. I, I i try and brainstorm a number of videos ahead of time so that when i get to the pitch i can really kind of because there's some days where you have an idea and you get to pitch, you're like, I'm just not feeling mm -hmm. doing this today. So I always try and get like at least five or six video in my notes on my phone. So if I like start a video, I'm like this, I'm just not feeling this today. I can just tr do the other one. I'm like, oh, I am feeling this one today. I'd say from start to finish, from planning, filming, editing, I mean, it could it could be about eight, eight hours, I would yeah. say. If, I, if you accumulated every, every second of thought and time filming editing uploading yeah. the yeah. thumbnail the, thumbnail yeah. yeah even the thumbnail getting the right image sometimes mm -hmm. takes a good i hate the thumbnail chunk of time. i hate the thumbnail i wish there's, that's, if there's good, one thing i could get rid of on youtube would be the thumbnail i just yeah. i just i just hate the like the need to clickbait and then also yeah. like even like try, for for me like i have a 20 minute video especially of my day i can't sum up i can't just write day in the life every single day yeah and then i'm like how do I sum this up without being clickbait, but get people to watch? And I just hate it. I hate it. YouTube used to be so much simpler. It used to deliver your video to yeah. every single subscriber, <laughs> but now it's like, you've got to entice your own yeah. subscribers to yeah. watch your videos. It's, it's a different animal now. And I think we're just so many people on there now. They've got to figure out a way to make it more, mm -hmm. people more visible. Otherwise no one would get watched ever. It's yeah. brutal, man. <laughs> A hundred percent. Um, and it was also crazy to think about too, is when we were on YouTube, uh, there's not, I mean, I started another reason I started YouTube too, because I would go on and it's kind of, you kind of said that you were so detail oriented. Like I remember watching some tutorials about how to hit a free kick and mm. like, yeah, go up on your toes and then you just kind of strike at it. I'm like, Oh, this didn't tell me anything. Yeah. Like right. nothing. Yeah. Like I know I'm just <laughs> supposed to run up on my toes and whatever, but where am I supposed to hit? Mm. What's like all the little tiny details I was, I was curious about as well, but that was a big reason. And then there the, was no real like vloggers of soccer. And that was something that I was like, why is there nobody? There's always the weightlifting and, yep. and like strength 
vloggers and there was all lifestyle vloggers, but there was no soccer players vlogging. And so I was like, oh, this is a new territory. And when we started, I feel like there really wasn't, I mean, there was like Dylan Tooby from uh, Progressive right. Soccer. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And then there was us. And then at that time, like, I can't really even think if there was any other major soccer channel. I think there was like online soccer coach or something that was oh uh yeah what was it osa or online? something like that yeah like orange was yeah, like, yeah, orange, yeah yeah but it was like was in his back many. garden he had like a soccer goal in his garden right yeah he yeah. was cool yeah so it was like there was so it was so it was i feel like it was a little bit easier to start but then at the same time like i still believe that good content can explode and, and like if you have good videos yeah. they're gonna do well but it's just funny too to think about how even five years ago it was such a different landscape yeah to start off um, yeah. and so I'm, I'll go to the next question too, but, uh, I, we've already touched on this one. This was like the difference between amateur semi-pro pro levels. And we kind of talked about that. Um, okay, let's do this one. What was your biggest failure and what did you learn from it? Oh man, maybe you should have sent me this one ahead of time. <laughs> yeah. I said, I wanted to be surprised. Yeah. Biggest failure. Oh man. It can be YouTube, soccer. It can be whatever, even general life. I mean, that's good that you have to think. Are you, oh, it, are you, this is the thing. Are, are you going through a bunch of failures? No. Or are you just like... Well, yeah, because I feel like it's got to be really profound. And I'm trying to think of something. Yeah. Unless I've suppressed it. I, could, I, mean, <laughs> I, f I mean, I fail every day, right? Yeah. We, we fail every day in, in the small things. But I'm trying to think of something like... like a major life-altering failure. Yeah. Do, do you have one? Honestly, I'm kind of like... I've had a very... I feel like I've lived life where it's like... I always ask myself... Um, in, if I'm 40 years old, am I going to regret the decision that I made? And I feel like in terms of failure, I'd feel like I'd be very, I'd view it as a failure if I really stopped doing something. And I feel like whatever I've picked up, soccer, yeah. weightlifting, prehab, like YouTube, whatever, I've always kind of like stuck with. So I feel like in terms of that, like I haven't really had a major failure. I would say like if you, if you were looking at my career, a big failure would be like me having to go down to New Zealand and play a year there. But even then, I, I really didn't. I saw that as just playing games yeah. and getting another contract. Yeah. But I don't um, really have one. I honestly don't have like a huge failure that pops out. Yeah, it's a tough one. I don't I don't think of a, this huge moment. Maybe, I mean, I might have got complacent. I would say complacency the last couple of, year, couple of years. And just because I've always been, okay, this will be it then. Mm -hmm. so I feel like I've always been someone that has stretched to get outside my comfort zone and seen the value of that. I've always, even from like a very young age, I've always been someone like, I want to try this. I want to try that. That's why I wanted to come to the U S to come to university instead of, you know, I've always been someone that's not afraid, like leave your friendship groups for a while and just go out there and explore and do something that's really going to challenge you. But I think maybe the past two to three years I've, I've sat in the comfort zone a little longer than I ever probably have in my life just for the fact of being back in Rochester, you know, with people that you enjoy being around, familiar places to get coffee in the morning. And, you know, I was, I was on the Lancers for a year. They made me captain by the next year. So I enjoyed that, you know, being on a indoor team where they get a decent amount of fans. You, you get wrapped up in it, right? So mm -hmm. you, I would say I, I allow myself to sit in that comfort zone a bit too long. I didn't, it was challenging, but I didn't feel challenged. I still felt like one of the, one of the better players on the team. And I liked how that felt, you know, and it, I never felt stretched. It was like, if I wanted to turn it on good, like the team would appreciate that. But if I, if I didn't, it wasn't that big of a deal. You know, my coach might sit me out for a, a couple extra minutes or something like that, but I didn't, I was in that comfort zone. So I, I, would, I would call that a, f a failure, not being true to myself, I mm -hmm. think, and just kind of enjoying the, the bubble effect a little bit too much. Um, I think that's why I was, I found endearing about the Philippines. We kind of talked about this after Australia. That's where I wanted to go because the level is a lot different there. You know, they're, they're a little bit behind on their football development and everything like that. So I thought if I played there, you know, I'd probably be one of the, the, the top players and I knew wages were good. I knew other British guys who had been over there and done very well and not had big resumes before going over and whatnot. So I think I've, I've seen that try to creep in at different times in my life, but I think the last couple of years was the first time I can honestly say that I think I've sat in the comfort zone longer than I have ever in the past, which mm -hmm. isn't, I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't 
I'm glad I recognized that. Mm -hmm. Even if it's at this age now, I didn't just do it forever. You know what I mean? I mean, even if this doesn't work out, I know at least I went out there and, and gave it a go. Cause if I did it, I think you only regret what you didn't do. Right. Yeah. So if I didn't come here, I didn't pursue another opportunity to play at a high level where I'm going to be on the, the lower end of the top players in the team, you know, struggling to get into the starting lineup and things like that, then I've not done myself justice because mm -hmm. that's not, and I think I owe it to the people that I make videos for and things like that. Cause I, I push that. I do a lot of individual training, you know, I'm always pushing myself individually, but you can only push yourself so far. You know what I mean? You need to be in an environment like you were saying, where there's people better than you, because if you're always competing against yourself, that's always your standard. You know what I mean? And you can mm -hmm. get very good at that small increments, but when you're surrounded by players who are at another level, then you have to step it up even more. So, yeah. Yeah, step it up another level every single day, every touch. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's big. No, I think that's a really good, a really good point. And I think that's funny is because like, I've had like tastes of, of comfort like that, where it's like, even like my contract in Orange County, like yeah, I'm in yeah. Orange County, how easy it would be oh, just to yeah. be like, oh, you know, I'm just going to stay here. Yeah. There's opportunities Straight at like to the lower, beach. like USL League Two teams, same thing, but it is like tough. But I've always told, and I tell me this all the time, but like, just give it to my career, but we'll be uncomfortable bouncing around, going wherever, like doing it. And then I can't wait to the point where it's like, I can finally be comfortable and like go to San Diego and get a house and then just be like, we don't have to move out of here in mm -hmm. nine months. Like it's just, we can settle down. We can go out and do stuff with friends and be like comfortable, you yeah. know, and obviously push outside the comfort zone with become elite in other areas, but have the, having your like actual life be comfortable. I'm, very much looking forward to that yeah, you know absolutely because it is tough it's tough bouncing around and, and it's funny too is kids always say this like i don't care as long as i'm playing soccer like doesn't matter yeah it's we all be, said that yeah, yeah. I, said, <laughs> I said that too and, and it's yeah. still obviously worth it because we're still doing it yeah and i always want to say that like it's still a hundred percent worth it but it is a lot harder than you think especially yeah. after years especially as you're getting older especially as you get married yeah. it gets harder and harder and honestly you don't think adulthood is ever coming until yeah. you're an adult yeah. you really don't and and i was the same way you know even in college i was like this is how life is always going to be i'm mm -hmm. just going to be kicking a ball around and having other people carry my weight basically in terms of like scholarships so i don't have to pay for anything and this and that and the other room and board and that's how you think life's going to be i'm going to get in this club and all my needs are going to be taken mm -hmm. care of but it's not real. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you start buying plants that you have to water and you're like, I'm an adult now. Like, yes. <laughs> here we goes. have a lot of plants in my apartment too. I have neither bought or watered any of them. So <laughs> Becca, Becca handles that. Yeah. Do you water them? Uh, yeah. I actually water this one. Yeah. But wow. I, I, I like, it's like with Gucci. I get like living things. I always have to, I feel like a big wow. need to take care of. Mimi's a lucky, lucky I mean, lady. Uh, yeah, you should. Mimi, hear that? <laughs> um, let's, let's, let's take a quick break. We'll turn off these cameras, restart them <laughs> yeah. again, and then we'll finish up the Q and A. So we talked about this a little bit about why your channel, like the skills that you have, why your channel was successful, but it, what advice would you give to somebody else wanting to play pro, um, and wanting to start a YouTube channel? What advice would you give them about handling both about being successful in the field and also being successful on YouTube. Yeah. Kind of a three part question. Yeah. Um, definitely make sure you have a handle on your ability to keep track of time and, and schedule because I, I, th I think you got to prioritize soccer first, right? You mm. got to prioritize your training because everything else kind of stems from that. If you're not training, you're not going to, be able to demo good on YouTube or, you know, give the right advice. You're not going to, yeah, you're not going to have a good presence on that. So I think focus on your training first, get your scheduling down, get to a point where training is second nature. I think I've heard you speak about this as well, but training should really be treated like another part of your day, like brushing your teeth or mm -hmm. making your breakfast. It shouldn't be something that you applaud yourself for ever. It's, it should be a part of your day. If you're genuinely pursuing being a professional or a high level athlete, it needs to just be a part of your day because I think a lot of people, they ask me, how many times should you train? Like how many times a week? I'm like, yeah. how, and I just say, how many times does a, a pro trainer eat a week? And they'll be like, oh, every day, maybe one. I'm like, why are you not training every day then? Because if you're going twice, three times a week, trying to get on a team where they st suddenly start training every day, your body's not gonna mm -hmm. take on that. So you, you need to be, I always say, 
it's kind of like the dressing for the job you want, not the job you have, right? So even if you're not professional, even if you're just a Sunday league player, even if you're not on a team, you got to just do whatever you can with the circumstances you're in. So if you can only train individually, you should be training every day. If you're training with a team, train as much as you can with that team and then outside still continue. So if you train three times a week with your team, the other three days should be by yourself. So once you get a handle of that, I would say that's when you can start going into YouTube because that's just going to add another distraction that if you're not disciplined with your training, mm -hmm. that's there's going to be a conversation like, do I do YouTube or training today? So if you're so solid in your training that literally you make appointments with yourself to train every single day, then you can start seeing what hours you have to allow for editing, what time you have for going out and shooting videos to uploading to YouTube and everything like that. So my advice would be just be realistic with yourself and how much time you have because if you're not training every day but saying you're tr wanting to train every day and then you're going to say oh, i'm going to upload on youtube every single day as well i could not imagine uploading on youtube every single day at this stage now i tried it once mm -hmm. earlier on like very basic like vlog style with my gopro and even that was an absolute nightmare i was mm -hmm. i was getting to bed every night at like 2 2 a.m i was getting up at like 7 8 and it was just terrible for my schedule so i think you need to just really know yourself know your habits know what your schedule's like and kind of work with that so it's going to look a little differently for everyone um I, and, and what stage of life you're at as well if you're in school if you have to be in school if you have a job or whatnot but time management's just just the key really and getting a handle on that but I do believe that, you know, there is 24 hours in a day. Yes, you've got to be sleeping for some part of that. But if you're disciplined enough, you can be very, very productive with the other hours of your day without getting burnt out and exhausting yourself at the mm -hmm. same time. But yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've had I've had periods I'm trying to think when specifically it was, but like I've had periods where like I felt it almost shift a little bit where I felt like in off seasons where all of a sudden the, the focus has gone. It's definitely was an off season. I think it was like a year or two ago and the focus started shifting from like, um, of like, Oh, I'm training and then documenting my training yeah. versus like, Oh, I'm going to go out and make a great YouTube video. Now, now I need to go train, you know? And there's like, it's a very small shift in that. But like I, I had that in my head of like, Oh, I was almost prioritizing the YouTube video yeah. and the drills and the angles versus more about what's going to help me the most as a player. Yeah. And then I had like, it only happened for like a week. And then I kind of like, was like, this is feel, it, I even felt in the videos off. Like I could feel it. Like something was okay. off. I couldn't, I couldn't really get it. And also I, I had this like a little epiphany of like, like, no, this the YouTube channel, everything is, is not, I have this, I only have all this because of my performance on the field. Like yep. that's the only reason that this is doing successful. I can't prioritize this and have my career start to slip away because then I'm going to lose both. You yeah. know? So then like I, I had that start to like where I'm like worrying a little bit too much about the video and then I stopped it and immediately went to, I'm going to just focus on the best workout routine for me, the best training for me and just bringing the camera along and documenting yeah. that. Even if it's boring, even if I, it's not a good video, I just want to have a good, training session you know yeah yeah it's funny you say that because i think my my content has 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 changed there's always been a core type of content that i've done you know documenting the training but there has been waves of different kind of content that i've tried uh when i first started doing indoor you know i really went heavy on documenting that for the sole reason it's funny and it's interesting to think about this now but it was all vlog style because I wanted to focus on my training. Mm -hmm. So I, I made it just literally just documenting instead of going out and thinking, okay, I need a set of drills that are around a certain theme, like agility drills or certain skills or things like that. I just did not want to make that content at the time because that was a, that felt separate from my goals mm -hmm. at the time. And it'll be interesting if, you know, if I end up staying here where we are training every day and, it, I can imagine my content will probably go back into more documentation, which I'm sure some people will be interested in because I, I do get a lot of comments asking, can we get more day in the life and this and that. That's not n my natural content, but when it is, how do I, how do I word this? But when, when I'm in a stage of life where it feels natural to document something mm -hmm. that does become my content where I feel like there's something worth documenting, yeah. if that makes sense. 100%, yeah. Because I don't do a big off-season day in the life. So I, 
I, I say my off season series is more like his five agility drills, his, mm. his, this many speed drills where I'm, I'm doing that type of training, but I want to package it in the videos to, to reach people and show the types of drills I'm doing rather than documenting my actual session. Mm-hmm. And then I'll turn the camera off and I'll continue to train. So I, but in the off season, that feels fine to do that. But during this time, I couldn't imagine going to the field on a Sunday, you know, when it's our only mm-hmm. off day and being, and doing like 50 ball mastery yeah. exercise or something like that, just cause I'm like, I'll, I'll get burnt out with that. Yeah. Um, no, and then my problem too was like, I would go out to, and I would go and film like the, like seven shooting drills or whatever. And then, but then it was all in my vlog. Like I would be making a vlog, okay. but I got caught up in the vlog of making the vlog more like, uh, interesting. And I was focused more about the video performing well yeah. than focused about, oh, I'm going to vlog actually my, my routine. Yep. Like I was more focused of like, oh, is this drill going to be entertaining to watch versus like, oh, is this drill actually going to help me? You know? <laughs> yeah, and so like, yeah. that was my problem of, of like, it was like, it was the, like, I was still trying to document, but I was turning the document into more of like a, a reality TV show. And I felt it in like a, one or two videos. I should go back and find which videos it were, uh, it was in, but like I felt it turning and it, it, and that's where I had that thing of like, no, if this is a vlog and I'm documenting my life, I need to take a hit on the, the entertainment value to really show the real thing. You yeah. Know? And that was my, that was when I had that, the big problem with that. And that's when I told myself like, you're a footballer first, YouTuber second, yeah. you know, that it's whole true. thing. I, I can remember the same thing because I remember sometimes when I did my The Season where it was documenting my first indoor season, if I felt like the training session, Becca would come along, my wife is Becca, by the way, for those who don't know, but she would come along and film the session. If I felt like the session wasn't entertaining, if it was just like passing drills, mm-hmm. I felt like I needed to gather guys up at the end, like let's do a crossbar challenge or like, let's just hit some free kicks just to get some top bins or whatnot. And instead of just authentically showing, nope, we come, we do passing drills and then we go home and we recover. It's not, it's not glamorous. It's not the F2. This is how it is, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, it is tough because you do want to entertain, but you do want to just show how it is. And I think you do a very good job of that. You, you just show it how it is now. And, and, and I think in your off-season training, when you show what you worked on a lot, it is a lot of 1v1. It's a lot of passing sequences and the simple touches, just doing it faster, at a higher quality, trying to minimize the mistakes. And I think it's funny because I think in the last few years, I've really focused more on the simple passing drills, using mm-hmm. walls, using other teammates. And I can't wait to do that now more and more and more just because I know as I've had other experiences in other countries and I've found that that is what the difference is. It really is how quickly can you receive a ball and then play it into the next person. It's really, there isn't like, in the sessions I've watched all this week, there's very talented players in the FC Tulsa team, but they're not doing all the crazy stuff that they are capable of doing. They're just doing the simple things fast, trying to be efficient for their team. And it doesn't look that appealing sometimes if you're making a YouTube video about it, but for those watching who are serious, I think we need to cater to those and prioritize those viewers more at times. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when, when, at least when we're thinking about our, our content, because that is the representation of what it is. Because I, I do a lot of skill videos. I enjoy it. I'm, I grew up watching Jogger Benito and my yeah. favorite players and whatnot. And that genuinely brings me a lot of joy playing around with the ball. But it's not always... I try and supplement that with... A variety of content as well and i do try and touch home in my training videos this is what it's all about when it's first touch it's passing it's it's simple work feel free to enjoy the ball but don't think don't let that prioritize your your vegetables right mm-hmm. in terms of your the, ne- the necessity things you need to be working on in your training I think. yeah yeah it's, and it's tough it, man it's, it's a tough it's a, it's a very hard balance like yeah even like uh like i mean like that's one thing i've really noticed about younger players coming and training with us um, over the years, over the last three years, you can see it all the time. The younger t- players that are used to just a lot slower speed of play, a lot more time on the ball, not as hard of tackles. They'll take, you know, extra touches when they should be taken two or one. Yep. They try to do a little bit too much, like turning and trying to do a move versus just playing the way they're facing. They try to do like uh, they're going one V one. They try to do a little bit too much of a skill move and lose it versus just even one step over and go. And like, that's what I've noticed. It's like, as these younger players come in, they have a hard time adapting and some don't ever adapt and some really do adapt. Yeah. But you can see it's like 
uh, playing a little bit more simple, a little bit more into the unit, and then on the special, the one time in the in the game, that's and then you have t- more space at that one moment. That's when you're like, yeah, have at it. Try an elastic go. Try to do a triple step over, or yeah. whatever. Like, go for it. Try to do something special. But ninety eight percent of the game is just literally playing the way you face, one two touch, get the ball moving, and being in the right area. Yeah, you know. And that's the thing with YouTube these days. There's so so many highlight videos out there from players when you watch Messi, when you watch Neymar, and you assume because that's what's being pushed in your face all the time. There's not a lot of full length matches on YouTube or and a lot of people don't have the patience to sit through it. Or you know, they, they always want that quick that quick buzz, right? They mm-hmm. wanna see what what goals were scored this Champions League, what kind of skills. They don't want to sit and watch what happened over ninety minutes. Why did this team lose why did this team win and they just mm-hmm. wanted to see the moments that won the game but really if you're watching the moments outside of that you get to see a little bit more of why the game was won and how the pace was dictated by what team or who had possession most of the game what moments did they try to get in behind the defenders and i think unless you're able to sit and watch 90 minutes you can't really appreciate what a team is all about you think that Barcelona only win because Messi scores Messi scores most of the goals but you need to watch the entire match to understand why I don't know about this season but you know it just in general why these teams are so successful mm. and why they attract these top level players because it's their style of play but I think especially the younger generation now they want with how social media is with TikTok and whatnot you scroll onto the next right and it's like 10 seconds or whatnot you're you're being trained to take information quickly you're not Mm -hmm. being trained to sit and be patient and and not be entertained every second because football's like that sometimes you can go for 20 minutes without a shot on goal but if you're if you're a student of the game that's very interesting to you and you, you can learn a lot from it but if you're not a student of the game if you're more of a fan or just looking for entertainment you're just going to be engulfed by these you know the highlight videos Mm -hmm. but and and it shows you know when a younger player comes in and they think every time they touch the ball they got to do something spectacular with it yeah it's not like that or you know it's really not like that or else you're just getting yelled at for losing the ball all because at the pro level it's ruthless if you're losing the ball people will tell you that you are messing up for the team like that's not like oh yeah keep trying that like it's like no you've lost it twice now you've lost it once now yeah that's too much yeah, and you, you'll get taught. I mean, I know there's guys even on FC Tulsa, you, you mm. were saying as well, that if you're dribbling unnecessarily, trying to show off in any way, you'll get... You're clamped. Yeah, <laughs> you get you're, clamped. they'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. No, but it is. And it's it's so hard too, because every time I say that, I always want to balance it out with like, no, you need something special. You should try stuff. You should go out like side of your comfort zone and try things. But then it's like, it's always, but I think the best way to do it is like, you have to understand the moments, you know? Yeah. And yeah. majority of the game is not the right moment to do yeah. that. But when you do get in the right moment, 100% do whatever you want to do to try to effectively beat yeah. somebody. And it's it's such a tough balance to try to like share that with, with younger players. But hopefully yeah. it's coming across right. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's instinctive, isn't it? Yeah. It's like it really the, is. The moments, really is. The moments open up in the moment. If you're mm-hmm. thinking, if you're running around the pitch saying, next time I get the ball, I'm yeah. going to try and rainbow flick this guy and volley it. Yeah. Then you, you're creating a perfect scenario that's just never going to happen. I even did that as a younger player. Like uh, my first one, two years as a pro, I would tell myself, it's like, oh, I just played it back to the center back. Next play, look for that winger. Next play, and it's like, okay, look for it. But I was like telling myself, next play, pass it to that right. winger. Even and if it, it was not on, instinctual, right? it was like, I was like, okay, I did this. Now I'm going to look for the long ball. Now I'm going to try to play this. And it was more of like a formula in my head versus like just playing instinctually what's set up. And I feel like as I've gotten older, it's, it's more about like, I've just turned off my brain and allowed like, my instincts of where to take the first touch, where to play that pass, like kick in more. Yeah. I feel like it's really helped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. What is, I mean, I, I, we've always touched on all these questions now too. Um, oh yeah. So we've talked about this just ourselves, but I want to talk about this in the podcast. Uh, and we've both kind of said that we really aren't like social media, like people like being, if like, if we didn't have YouTube channels, I don't know how much we would both be posting on yep. Instagram about our lives and everything. Um, where do you see yourself and social media in like five years, 10 years and 20 years? So where do you, how much do you see yourself posting? Are you still posting on YouTube? When do you think of yourself at 35, 
uh, 40 and 50, what's, what's your relationship with social media look like? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because from a personal standpoint, I don't absorb a lot of social media. Mm -hmm. I, I try and like, I find myself, I shouldn't say this, but I mute a lot of people, you know, <laughs> that I, I know mm -hmm. just because I'm sick of, if it's not having a good effect on me, mm -hmm. it, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be going about your day and have your mood changed. Yeah. And if your mood's changing as a result, if it's a good thing, then yeah, great. But if your mood's like, if you're getting irritated or anything like that, and you're letting, you're letting something that's not actually in your physical world affect your physical world, then I think that's a good indicator that you social media isn't necessarily a healthy thing for you. Um, where I see myself in five years with social media, I mean, I'm trying to use it as healthily as possible, I'm trying to use it as a result. I try and call it a one-stop resource for, for footballers. So my goal is to get, you know, a big library of drills so that players can never feel stuck no matter where they are and they can still do something. You know, I want to collaborate with other people who are more knowledgeable than me so I can secondhand provide that for my audience as well. You know, going back to what we said at the beginning, I don't know everything. I don't know, you know, I know so little compared to so many people, you know, but I want to share as much as I can because there's people that know even less than I do. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So you've always got to pass information down, you know, always learn from people above and, and try and always pass down. You know, that's, that's the most grat gratifying for me at least. So I see myself in five years, hopefully built that into something that's even bigger than now, whatever that looks like. I'm hoping over the next few years I get, some more experience playing so that I can, again, secondhand share that knowledge with people, speaking with people that I meet at different clubs, coaches, even like working with um, the strength and conditioning coach and things like that, where you get, you get real information from real people rather than, you know, you can search on Google all you want. And I know you've done, you've done courses, so you've taken it to another level in terms of like qualifying yourself and learning the right information. But there's a lot you can learn from working with other people. And I hope to, I hope to share as much of that through my journey on my channel over the next few years. I can't see myself continuing to document my journey much longer than five years. Mm -hmm. Um, we kind of talked about this, but I, I hope 7MLC turns into something where it's not about me. It's more about it's a resource that continues to help, even if I f can fully step away or be more in the background of it. I I really hope that it it can be a tool that can be used far greater than any way I can use it. You mm -hmm. know, I, I don't I don't know what that looks like. I have some ideas that I've um toyed with you know i would like to have a facility of my own one day so i can actually work with players and then use that facility to film um get other coaches in and whatnot i would say if i had it i mean how i'm feeling right now with how social media is going and everything i would hope that in 10 years my face isn't on it anymore mm -hmm. you know i'm in that next chapter of life i have a family i'm focusing on them but i also have this this thing that's helping others as well. Mm. And, but that's what I, I want to make sure it's always coming from a place of sincerely trying to help. I hope it, I hope it always comes across that way. At least 20 years. Oh, I couldn't even imagine. Um, be 50. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the thing is too, it's a hard question. Cause you don't even know what social media is uh, yeah, going to look I like. I mean, I hope I'm still alive at 50. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know what social media is going to look like. Oh, but do you see the same thing, like, but still just you even stepping back further from it? Yeah, I, I, I see myself not to hide or anything like that, but there's only so much I can, I, I can give. And obviously, you know, if, if people want me involved still, if people miss that, if people think 7MLC suffers without 7MLC, mm. then, <laughs> you know, I'll be around in some capacity, but I... I don't want to, I, I never wanted the channel to be about me in general. You know, it's not like, here's what I can do. You know, this is me. It's just like, here's, here's something you can do. Here's, here's stuff for you. I, want, I always put the, the player in mind that I imagine myself coaching. I always try and treat my videos like I have one other player with me and I'm sharing with that one player. Like I'm coaching, like we talked about before, the whole inspiration was going from a 1v1 training scenario where you're training another player and trying to, mass that you know mm. and try and be more efficient and reach more people with it because there is there is a there is a still a lack of 
high quality technical coaches in a lot of places in the world, especially in the US, I would say, you know, yeah. like really touching on that technique side of the game. And um, I think that's what my channel centers around it is very technical, but I want to be able to do even more than that. But I know, I know that I can only take it so far in terms of like nutrition, you know, strength and conditioning, tactical side of the game. I don't think I've ever done any tactical stuff on my channel just because I don't feel qualified. I, I share what I know, I guess, you know, I've done a couple of the match analysis similar, similar to what you've done, but there's only, you know, that's how I look at the game, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? But there's people far more knowledgeable than me. So I would like to grow it and grow it and grow it. And um, I just really always want to just be a tool to help players improve those. So I, I, yeah, I just, that's a long winded answer of saying, I have no idea. Really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's always no, the yeah, best we yeah, don't know. Yeah. So you just kind of should have just, no, just started there. <laughs> no, that's good. It is good. And I think that that's part of YouTube. Like we talked about is like, you're so fixed about the neck, the one video ahead, the next video you're posting, the next three that you're kind of not even focused about the long term view of your channel. Yeah. It, like that's how it is for me. At least it's always like, I'm just going to, okay, I want to do this vlog. And then I got this two minute Tuesday idea. That's what I have in my head. And then I don't really, I, and it transitions, like you talked about the waves of your content and like what's yeah. going on, but it kind of happens like naturally and like organically based off what's actually going on in your life and your career. Yeah. So like it's, it's, you kind of like naturally kind of like change based off what you want to do, what's yeah. been going on with your life, your career. Like it's, it's like for me, it's always been naturally progressing. Yeah. Yeah. Cause if, if someone asked me a few years ago, you know, what would it look like in 2021? I don't know if I would have described it how it is now. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it, it does, it grows with you. Right. So, but I think because we are so attached to our channel, it does, our personality comes through and it, and it grows in accordance with our stage of life as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Cause it, you know, when you have a family and a house and everything else, it's, it's what, what, do, what do you, yeah. What do you make videos about at that point? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, here's you, breakfast, yeah, kids. Yeah, yeah. Like, I know it's very, and I'm wondering. Son's yeah. still crying. Yeah, there he is. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be really, really interesting. I have three more questions. I'm going to okay. restart the cameras yeah. one more time because I want to make sure that it's recording and then uh, we'll power these out. Cool, man. Okay. Uh, are you like currently, are you big, do you read books a lot? And yeah. if you do, do you have any books that you like, who, what books do you recommend to your friends? Yeah. I mean, I actually, I would say I only started really reading last year. I don't mm -hmm. know if, the whole global situation had a effect on that, but I did find myself, you know, cause we were at home a little bit more. I, I don't know why I really wanted to start reading and I've never had that desire before. The first book I picked up was shoe dog, mm -hmm. which is, you know, about Phil Knight, the f founder owner of Nike, how he started his whole journey. I think that's a great book. If you're, you know, if you have your own business or brand or company, I think that's valuable for anyone. Just seeing the journey and kind of understanding even a massive company like Nike had so many challenges early on. So it kind of puts into perspective when, when you're having challenges with your own projects and whatnot, like don't, you don't need to be too phased by it because Nike took so many massive changes of direction. It started out, it was only supposed to be like a running shoe mm -hmm. company and, and it's turned into I don't know if it's still the biggest brand, but I'm pretty sure it's the biggest sporting company on earth. Um, that was my first book. That was one I, I struggled to put down. I really struggled to put down. After that, I read um, Matthew McConaughey's Green Lights. Mm -hmm. It's just a autobiography. And it, again, it kind of shows his, his challenges through his acting career. He's obviously a very talented actor, but it shows his journey. He started very late in uh, in terms of like the typical time of getting into acting. So it showed how he kind of navigated through that. I do really enjoy autobiographies and I try to, I, I like athletes, but I, I do try and get a good well-rounded scope of other people's lifestyles as well, just successful people in general. And what I found through reading those books of different people, there's a lot of similarities mm -hmm. between people who are successful. Another really good one was uh, Andre Agassi's book. It's called Open. I'd recommend that to anybody, uh -huh. like amazing tennis player, but he had some real mental battles and a lot of physical battles as well. He's struggling with a lot of injuries, um, had some drug problems as well. And uh, he overcame a lot as well. And his, his upbringing was really interesting. And I found that book really hard to put down. I think that was probably my third book. Right now I'm reading, for the second time, reading Relentless. Mm -hmm. I know you've read that book as well, but that's, um, he's a, he coached a lot of the biggest NBA players in the world. 
took their game to another level. And he, he has a very interesting way of kind of categorizing different people based on their habits. And it, it's interesting to, to read how he defines, he calls them like cleaners, closers and, um, coolers, coolers. Yeah. 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 Um, very interesting book and I think you can learn a lot about yourself and it's all about just kind of being relentless you know and um, I think that's a great book to read I think you can read that book over and over again Mm -hmm. and take something different away from it each and every time relentless is a good one Um, I think I've read relentless about 10 to 15 times really yeah when when, when was the first time the first time was junior year of college my roommate had read it and was like bro this book's gonna change your life and I was like no, no, I got enough schoolwork. I don't need to read. It's like, no, I'm telling you, it's Chris, Chris Schultz. And he's like a goalkeeper. He ended up playing pro in New Zealand and Australia. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Like uh first division, New Zealand and then, uh, NPL Australia. And he was just like, yeah, it's going to like, bro, you got to read it. And I was like, no, no, no. And he finally convinced me and I read it. I'm like, that was the best book I've ever read in my life. It's yeah. just like so many like little like paragraphs just completely like it's always thoughts or feelings I've had, but yeah. I've never physically read like another person say yeah and it's just like i that's how i feel that's exactly how i feel and I've, i i have never put it into words yeah you've it's nailed it crazy. there it's something that i could probably try and spend 30 minutes trying to explain he explains it in like yeah. a sentence mm-hmm. it's very digestible you know chapters are quite short he has a, a list that he ranks every one number one doesn't he because they're mm-hmm. all equally important yeah that's that's i think any athlete any person really pursuing anything could could certainly benefit from that Nothing else coming off the top of my head is big right now. Oh, the subtle art was a, oh, yeah. was a good one. Um, what about you? Yeah, they pretty much nailed those ones. Relentless yeah. is always, I always read Relentless probably like at least once a season, whatever, especially when I'm not like feeling like I'm playing well. I always like to go back and read it or like I'm just not like in that, like, like just even like competitive mindset. Like I always feel like I'm super competitive, but there's just times where it just, I don't know if complacent's the right word, but you're just playing and you're just kind of like almost playing to play and yeah. training to yeah. train to get over training. You're going to the games and you're playing the games, but you're not like, like I'm, I'm there to kill, you know, I'm there to like play. So like whenever I feel myself just slipping a little bit, I'll read the book again and it kind of like helps just kickstart that. Yeah. Uh, I've been reading the Dune books, like they're just sci-fi books, but I did that over, um, again quarantine I was just like I just need a break like I just want to do just turn my mind off and just read not look at a screen not edit because it's always like work 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 I just wanted to complete like relaxation reading something and then uh yeah I like the subtle art of not giving an f that was a good book yeah and then I read this one book um uh the one thing and it's about oh, yeah. like I, I really actually like that. that up after you recommend that looks like a, I'm gonna have to get that one yeah it's very, it's again it's like one of those like books that you're like duh like of course like focusing on one thing yeah. is, is more helpful but again it's like when you read it and you see other people uh with their businesses or careers or whatever just focusing on and limiting the hours they work it's almost like the four hour work week type thing and just focusing on one thing it helps so much and I it's like for me uh, a real example is like for YouTube like stop focusing on like all the lit because you can always with your own business you can always do it a million things you can For never sure. stop posting never stop doing anything but i just ask myself what's the one thing that's going to help my business grow let's make the best youtube video possible that's mm-hmm. the best thing i can do so then sometimes i just zone out on the instagram stories zone out on like the extra facebook ads zone out on like whatever all the to-do list things and just focus on how can i make the best youtube video and it just like mentally just helped me with that which i really like yeah but it's, again, it's one of those like it's obvious, you know. Yeah, I mean, reading's underrated. It yeah. really is. Couldn't couldn't recommend it enough. Yeah. All right. Last two questions. Um, what are you not good at as a person? Okay. And then on the field as a player, and then on YouTube. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is a thinker. Yeah, this is yeah, like yeah. your every question that you usually get is always like kind of focused around your strengths. So I was like, okay, let's flip it around. Yeah, what am I not good at? I, I'm, I, I'm not saying that like, oh, there's just nothing. There's so many things. Yeah, there's so many things. Like, I'm, nah, not, I'm not, I'm yeah. not bad at anything. I'm good. But again, I want it, you know, I want it to be yeah. profound. Yeah. Like, oh, I man. know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. What am I not good at? So sometimes I'm not always, I'm not, I'm not good. I'm not, this is a terrible English. I'm not good at not worrying sometimes uh-huh. about the future i'm i'm not good 
in situations where it feels out of my control, you know, and um, I think the first few days of even being here at Tulsa, it's the first time in a, a little while, just because I've been at the Lancers for a few years, where the outcome of this is I can do as much as I can, but it really isn't within my control whether or not, you know, I get signed mm. or anything like that. And sometimes I'm not good in that situation. I have to recalibrate a lot because I, I think I, I start wondering too much, like what, what does a coach want to see? What, and instead of just being natural and just playing with freedom and instinctively, sometimes I can get caught up in stressing about what's the decision going to be? You know, am I going to get signed from this? You know, um, how close should I get with the teammates right now? Cause am I, am I going to be here or is the agent going to send me to another team in a couple of weeks? Because, you know, anytime a situation isn't within my control, which is a lot of situations, but I think especially scenarios like this, you really feel that sometimes I stress a little bit too much, mm -hmm. you know, Be my wife, Becca will tell you, she, when we have our FaceTime call, she's like, I just, I can tell you just need to chill. You know, I can just see it. You need to just like relax and, you need to enjoy it. And what's the worst that, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Mm -hmm. Cause like, what is the alternative if I don't get signed? Yeah. I, it's, it sucks, but it's not, it's not the end of the world. There's other opportunities. My lifestyle before this wasn't terrible at the same time. You know what I mean? There's people who are in a lot worse situations. Yeah. Like you and I both know we've played on teams here where people are coming from different countries where their home life is awful. And this is like a, a get out for them. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, this is, this is like the utopia, you know, it, it's, it's actually taking them, taking them from such a, such a dark place, you know, and um, the alternative to not getting signed here would be. That's a lot more drastic. Yeah, 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 exactly. So sometimes you've got to put it all in perspective. Like I'm so grateful to be here. I'm just, I get to kick a ball around every day, even if, I do my best and it's not, it's not enough. I've been here the last few weeks. I've had some great experience with it. And even that in itself is not something everyone gets to experience, you know? Mm. So again, yeah, I think, I think one of my biggest struggles is being in situations where I feel like I'm not in control, you know? And I think that's probably a little bit of why I'm on YouTube. I don't know if you agree with this, but it's your thing, you know? And yeah. I think, I think I was always going to start something where it was going to be my business, where I feel in control of it, even though there's still so many things that aren't in my control, you feel at least, you know, you're on your schedule, you, you're choosing when you upload videos, you're choosing when you make it. And that's, that's something I've got to be better at, you know, just like learning to only, only worry about the things I can control and everything else is just kind of like, roll with it it's fun mm -hmm. it's life life isn't about knowing what's happening next because if you did it would be super boring you know what i mean so yeah 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 all right and then uh like what about just specifically as a as a player as a footballer what am i not good at yeah yeah i i think if let me put it this way if i saw my five-year-old self again I would say work on the basics now mm -hmm. and focus on that, focus on that and don't worry about your free kicks. Don't worry about your skill moves or anything until you are so competent with your basics. Um, Cause I, I think at least coming into this scenario where the ball is moving so quickly, sometimes you're overthinking, you know, where mm -hmm. it needs to be more instinctive. And I think instinct comes from so much preparation just being having the ball fired into you and you firing it out of different angles and to different players, finding those little split gaps. And I, I would have spent a lot more time just solely working on that because that is 95%. That's probably even underestimated. It's probably 99% mm -hmm. of the game is that instinctively moving the ball around, keeping it. And yeah, I, I think sometimes again, I, I want to be a, uh, a game changer I want to be a difference maker on the field and I think sometimes my weakness is feeling like you've got to do that often mm -hmm. and if you and if you don't have a direct impact on the score sometimes I'll walk away feeling like I had a bad game do you know what I mean just yeah. because of certain teams I've been in when I've been that player to take all the free kicks or this and that and the other you can still have a very good game or do your job for your team without even touching the ball at times if you're pressing in the right areas you know and different things understanding that 
especially as you get to a higher level, it is a, a team sport. Mm-hmm. You know, it really is. And it's not an individual sport at all. Mm-hmm. And then what about like specifically on YouTube, like creating as a YouTuber, creating YouTube videos? What are you not good at? Mm-hmm. I'm, well, I've learned this recently working with Unisport. Mm-hmm. I'm terrible at working with scripts yeah. and um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Cause I, everything I do is kind of freestyle on my channel. It's like just my thoughts, but anytime I, you know, again, it's, it's kind of where I feel like somebody else is kind of telling me what I need to do or um, I'm, I'm terrible with that. Sometimes, sometimes I'm terrible at make, trying to get every single shot perfect. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I think perfection is such a um, subjective term and something that you appreciate and you think is perfect. No one else even, even cares or realizes it. And I think I need to be a bit more efficient i i think at times i think becca would explain this a lot better because she's the one having to get the shots a lot of the time where i'm like no i just need a little bit different. you know i just need it to go right here or i i think i've got to be a bit more organic i think at mm-hmm. times when it comes to comes to my like tutorial videos like, i not everything needs to be a perfect top bins because not every goal very rare goals are perfect top bins in a match you know just showing i think i'm i need to do more showing how it really is you know mm. and um more documentation instead of creating i guess and shooting videos um yeah yeah that's good that's good I answers think, yeah all right last question now okay. um if i were to give you just a billion dollars right now mm. what would you do how would you spend it what would you what would you do with your life? What would your life look like? Ooh. Um oh man. <laughs> uh, a million dollars. Yeah, that's a lot. So yeah. literally like you can't yeah, you can't so not sp- you can't spend it. You can't much. run out. Yeah. Yeah. Um I think I would for me I'd love to take care of my family first. That would be awesome. You know, just like pay off everyone's mortgages and mm-hmm. just get everyone kind of set up. Obviously get a house for me and my family me and my wife, um, I would like to open up a facility. That'd be really cool. Like a seven MLC training facility. But if, you know, if I had a billion dollars, it wouldn't, obviously at, at this stage in our lives, there is, you do have to think about income, you know, and, and when it comes to YouTube and that, of course we want to give all the free stuff in the world, but at the same time we do have to put food on the table for our families. Mm-hmm. So, but obviously if you have a billion dollars, that no longer has to be an issue and you can only at that point, only focus on giving, 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 giving. And I try and do that as much as possible now, but you can't only, you, you know, you got, you got to do that tactically enough that you can still yeah. survive off it. So it'd be, it'd be awesome to just completely take away that responsibility of having to mm-hmm. <laughs> provide and, and just literally have like your facility be an open place for anybody to come and train or clubs who can't usually, players who can't usually afford to, to come into that kind of environment, they can get that opportunity. And um, if if I, if I gave you it today, would you go and open straight up the facility? Or would you still want to play for three, four years? I still want to play. Yeah, yeah, because I I think I think the the only way I can give as much as I I can through my channel is to have basically exhausted myself mm-hmm. as a player, you know, and and gone through as much experience as possible because that's that's really the only way you can share any lesson is to really you 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 can regurgitate information right but i think the lessons that you learn the best is when someone's been through something and they share that exact experience with you and that's you can articulate your message so much better so i know in three i know in one season here in the us so i'm probably going to learn more than i have the past five years or so you know so I would 100% play uh, mm-hmm. for sure. You know, I, yeah, that wouldn't even be a question. So I always think that's very, a very good thing when if you were given like a life changing amount of money and you would still work, you know, you'd still do exactly yeah. what you're doing right now. Like that's, I think that's the best sign you can possibly have. Cause yeah. if you're like, oh, if I got a billion dollars, I would go straight You'd never over see me here. Again. Yeah, yeah. I'd be over here on this beach and I'd be working yeah. at this, doing something completely different. You're like, well, Okay. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's always, I think a very good sign if someone's like, no, I mean, I'd probably, my apartment would be a little bit bigger, but I would still be 
playing for FC Tulsa. You yeah. Know? But like, it's always, it's always. It's funny to a think about side. if you answer that question when you're 10 years old, it's like, oh, I had to get a helicopter or like <laughs> a private island. And I'm just like, all of that just sounds so stressful. Yeah. It's funny because I do, I do think the older I, I get, the simpler I want my life to be, you mm-hmm. know? I think the less clutter you have, I think the more you clutter your life, you, you kind of forget a little bit about who you are. You know what I mean? I think that's what, one thing I'm definitely grateful for with all the experiences of traveling to different countries where you can't take a lot with you. And I've, it's just been me and my wife, you know, traveling. You, all you're taking with you is yourself, you know, mm. and, and, and you're growing. It's If you just sit in one place and your assets get better, your house gets bigger, your cars get better, sometimes you don't actually grow you know so yeah. i think it's more about like accumulating more rather than like doing what focusing on what areas actually make you like being feeling fulfilled you know yeah it's less like something that's like it, it humbles yourself when you move out of your apartment and then you're back to square one and you have a suitcase and a backpack and then you're like okay this is my belongings yep. now then all you're thinking about is like okay what's the next step to make me like for my next goal, like what's going to make me feel fulfilled? Like yeah. what do I want? You're not focused on like, oh, if I can get this bonus or this, then I can get this new like refrigerator or whatever. It's kind of like, it's not, it's less focused on things. Cause if I, I even for Christmas, my mom's like, what do you want? I'm like, well, I, I mean, I'll take a coffee machine. Yeah, but other than yeah. that, like anything I have is I'm now going to have to bring with me wherever I go. So I'm more focused on like experiences and doing stuff that actually is like very fulfilling in the moment, you know, rather than just like yeah. more more stuff, bigger house, bigger, whatever. So what would you, what would you do with a million? L- uh, literally billion, sorry. a billion, yeah, it's, yeah. Think big. Uh, I was going to say million, huh? Can no, 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 a million? <laughs> in, in today's day and age, yeah. I <laughs> know uh, you still have like a mortgage of yeah. a million dollars. Um, a billion, same thing. I'd literally be, I'd probably have a two bedroom apartment, so a one bedroom, but I would, uh, yeah, I would just, I, I'd probably have like a, like just be still playing, still training, yeah. still playing, still making YouTube videos. I wouldn't have to worry about sponsored videos. Yeah. No, never deal with a sponsor ever again in my life. That would be cool. Because yeah. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'm with you. Yeah, just it'd be like having a little bit more space. But other than that, like I'm so happy doing exactly what I'm doing. That's and great. then probably hire people, do a little bit more of the stuff I don't like, maybe edit a video here or two, uh, or like one extra video a week so I can focus more on just editing one video better. Um, but I still would want to edit, you know, mm-hmm. I would probably hire someone to try to like post on Instagram for me, but I would still want to like be making content for that. But I would still keep writing become late. I would still keep trying to play pro and yeah, yeah not, not much would honestly change just a little bit. I'd have a two bedroom in an office. That's about it. It's a good sign. Yeah. Yeah, man. That's all awesome. right. So that's it for the podcast. Cool. Sweet. Um, obviously you guys all know who Michael Cunningham is, but for the one person who's listening to this, who might not know, uh, Michael Cunningham runs seven ML- MLC. It's a huge YouTube channel, Instagram training platform. Um, just a whole bunch of content. So everything, do you have a TikTok? I do. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's not big. I, I kind of just put my Instagram content on there, yeah. but I think it's seven MLC training. All right. Well, everything, TikTok, everything's yeah. going to be in the description. So yeah. check out Michael Thanks, man. and uh, wish him luck at, at Tulsa. All right. Well, anything, any last thing to say? No, man, honestly, sign off? It's a privilege to be here. I've watched you for a long time, admire your stuff. And it's, it's funny that we're yeah. here in person in these circumstances, but I'm, I'm loving it. Yeah. It, seem, it seems perfect at the same time. So. Exactly. No, 100%. And yeah. same, same exact thing to you as well. Thank you. So, all right, guys. Hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Be sure to hit the thumbs up button if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening on Spotify, I don't know. You can't even like it, but do something. <laughs> Give it a good review. All right, guys. Peace.